it's a visit with a person of high strangeness. Uh, we're still in March of uh, 2010. Do they say 2010 or 2010? I think I like 2010 better. Well, either way, um, this is number three in our series of um, shows with uh, the subject of remote viewing and uh, mind stuff. Yeah, that, that, that's it. My camera is uh, being interfered with. I have a lot of electricity or something. So anyway, luckily we have two cameras today. So let me put this down here. Um, we're going to continue with Lynn Buchanan today. And um, when JFK went to go and do that interview, they talked until they were done. Uh, which is really, really a good thing to do when you travel from Michigan all the way to New Mexico. And so instead of two shows um, with, actually with Lynn, um, it just went on and on. And so we got enough material out of that to really detail things for you. And so we kind of hope that uh, that's going to give you a little insight in the life of some of the people that are known to us or most of us. Um, are very instrumental in how things go these days. Let's see, I have, um, have some notes here. Oh, I'm still, this is week number three of wearing my rags. Uh, I had mentioned that I needed rags, went to Goodwill and bought a bag of rags and they were these wonderful t-shirts. And um, let's see where we are. For those of you needing wanting or requiring or desiring uh, classes with, uh, I'm not sure about Dr. Mitchell, but with Lynn Cannon, uh, please give me a call and I can arrange that for you. And uh, I broke my spoons uh, over the last two weeks, so uh, my camera person, Mike, uh, would you be nice enough uh, while we're watching the inside to go and find me some new spoons somewhere? Yes, I'd be glad to. Yeah, so we can continue that. And uh, hey, springtime everywhere, I think. <laughs> we were lucky. We had spring almost all winter, but um, some some of the other friends wasn't so so content. And can we change the weather? Hmm. That's another story. <laughs> That's going to be another show. So... Uh, but we are in charge of who we are and how we want to live our life. So all I'm going to tell you now, let's go to, um, to Lynn B. Cannon's house and uh, see what else he's going to share with us on the subject of remote viewing. I'll see you a little later. And, uh, you know, um, the remote viewing process parallels our lives very closely. Absolutely. And uh, we have learned that the difference between two remote viewers is generally not a difference in ability. If they're both following the same scientific principles, mm -hmm. they're both going to come up with generally the same accuracy, but they're going to do it in a different way according to that person's lifestyle and that person's uh, old habits and um, you know a person who's who's curious in life is going to be curious in remote viewing a person who immediately jumps to a conclusion and reacts in life is going to do the same thing in remote viewing and this is the reason why many times we have such a hard time taking that person and unlearning many of their life habits mm -hmm. and um, teaching a remote viewer is just as hard as learning to be a remote viewer <laughs> that's right uh, I always figure when I have a student that I have two students Absolutely. I have the conscious student and the uh, the subconscious student as well Plus, I have a third student, and that's the body that I have to teach the, the uh, sensories and the 
physical reactions. Um, we have an, an, another analogy, which is the main analogy of, of controlled remote viewing. Let's say you're the president of a company. It's taken you your entire life to get there. You've worked hard to get there. You're in charge, and, and you know you deserve to be the president of the company. Well, that's your conscious mind. I mean, it's taken all those experiences you've gone through and everything, and it's finally gotten to this stage where it's in charge. Okay. Let's say that one day the owner of the company walks in and says, I've got a young kid that I want to uh, teach how to run a company, and so for the next week you're working for him. What's your reaction? Like hell, you know, <laughs> that's not going to happen. And so then the owner of the company walks in with your own son. Oh, mixed emotions. I want to help this kid. I don't want him to be the president of the company this week, but I do want to help him. And so while I'm helping him learn how to be president of the company, I'll do the work for him. Okay? You see what's happening? The kid doesn't get to run the company because dad is there showing him, helping him. But let's say the kid comes up with an idea that the dad realizes, I should have thought of that years ago. What's he going to say? He's going to say, good idea. I'll take care of that next week. And so he's going to hold the kid down. At the end of the week, one of two things will happen. The kid will go to his dad and he'll say, I failed, but only because you wouldn't let me do the job. Or the kid is going to go to his dad and say, I succeeded but only because you wouldn't let me do the job. And either way, the dad loses, okay? The company may have run, the company may have, you know, not suffered any at all, but the dad loses. And um, in controlled remote viewing, you have to let the kid run the company. And in many, many psychic methodologies, using this same analogy, what happens is they decide we're going to send the dad on vacation. We're going to send the president on vacation for a week. And so here's the kid in charge of the company, and here's the president of the company over on a beach chair in Maui, and there's his cell phone. And every few minutes, man, he calls back to the this secretary or that secretary, what's the kid doing now? Well, you put him on, you stall until next week or something like that. The dad's out there running the company still. The kid just doesn't know it. And um, in hypnosis, they have what's called the hidden observer, the invisible observer. That um, in, uh, in hypnosis, you give hypnotic commands and the person does it, but you give one With, with hypnosis and with many other things, you can't make a person do what they consciously would not want to do because the conscious mind keeps checking back in. As a highly trained CRV monitor, you can watch a hypnosis session and you'll see the person in a trance, but awake, back asleep, awake, back asleep. It's the president checking in make sure that the company's running okay. With controlled remote viewing, we have another tactic. We put the president, the conscious mind, down on the loading docks and keep him so busy that he doesn't have time to interfere with the company. And that way the kid gets to run the company. And the incoming information, we have all of this very complex structure and with, let's go back to the analogy. Here comes a box of information in on the truck. President's on the loading dock. He picks it up. He says, where do I stack this? So many times we'll say a verb goes here, a descriptor goes there, a conceptual idea goes here, a noun goes here, a, you know, uh, an emotional thing goes here, 
my emotions go here, but some of you at the target's emotions go there, and we have all these columns. We keep the conscious mind so busy figuring out where to stack things that he not interfering with the, with the company, mm -hmm. okay? And so uh, the idea in controlled remote viewing is that we have this structure that keeps the conscious mind busy and keeps you physically busy as well. And the kid can stay in charge of the company. And so in, in that respect, the remote viewer who is the kid is always in charge. Yeah. And, um, and so you, when a person gets really good at remote viewing, they get to where they know how to stack things immediately and their conscious mind has time to, you know, time to go get in trouble and check back upstairs and everything else. And that's when we teach them the next level, which is more complex and more complex. Tasker's intent. A lot of people say that the tasker's intent is going to run the session. That the viewer wanting to please the tasker is going to find out what the tasker wants him to find, whether it's true or not. Mm -hmm. For a beginning viewer, that's, that's often true. Um, and so uh, basically what's happening is the remote viewer is remote viewing the tasker to find out what the tasker wants to know because he wants to be successful. He, you know, the viewer wants to be successful and please somebody. Uh, we train you to not go to your feedback. We train you to go to the target. We also know that what a viewer wants to get, the imagination will create. And therefore, we teach our students that the most important thing to want is the absolute truth. Uh, if you want the truth more than you want there to be aliens running around at a site, then you'll find the truth. If they are running around at the site, you'll find it. If they're not, you'll find that. If you want to know the truth more then you want to not hurt the family of the missing child who is there by saying the child is dead, you'll find the truth about the child, not what you want to find for that family. And so um, uh, we teach our students that there is nothing more important than the truth and that you've got to want that more than anything else. As you experience that, and as you make that your habit in remote viewing, it gets to where Tasker's intent is nothing. Mm -hmm. You just blow past Tasker's intent, and it has no effect on your session. But for an inexperienced viewer, yeah, Tasker's intent is going to, uh, is going to have an effect. And it's amazing because, because all the viewer gets is a bunch of numbers. And somewhere out there in the ether, there is a tasker saying, you know, uh, uh, someone abducted a child and I want him found. Well, guess what the viewer is going to find? A male. Right. And it may have been the mother that took the, you know, mm -hmm. but the viewer is going to find basically what the tasker wants unless that viewer wants the truth more than anything else. You've got to care about the truth beyond every other thing. That's when you're a world-class remote viewer. And once you find the truth, you can report it. But then if you get curious about it, you're going to really be a world-class remote viewer. Uh, yes, but I would tend to point out that there's a danger involved in putting too much faith in what you think the perception is going to be. Okay. Because that's your conscious mind expecting something. And if you can get rid of that, then the perception comes and you report it. Uh, a very dangerous part of remote viewing, not 
dangerous for the viewer, but dangerous for the session, um, is uh, I got red, I got green, I got yellow. Oh, I think I'm going to get a traffic light. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, guess what you're going to get? You know, I don't care what your mind and body tell you, you're going to get a traffic light. And, um, and that anticipation of a perception is destructive to the process of relaying the truth. Okay. Uh, you have got to stay, I, I tell my students, you've got to be the professional village idiot. And the village idiot keeps nothing in his mind. Whatever hits his brain comes out his mouth and is completely forgotten, you know, one second later, is not anticipated. And so you've got the village idiot to whom the doctor, the lawyer, the, the police chief, everybody else comes for advice because this is the one totally honest person in town. Mm -hmm. right. And a remote viewer has got to be that way. The perception hits, it comes out onto the paper, and then it is gone because you're the professional village idiot. And if you sit there and anticipate what your next perception is going to be, you, you just, you're not doing your job. Um, the process of, of using nouns uh, is discouraged in the basic course among inexperienced students. And the uh, process, once you get down the basics and you learn how to do controlled remote viewing, then we introduce a method by which you can get nouns. And there are many times in a uh, controlled remote viewing session, at the upper levels, once you have gained really good sight contact, that you will get, there's a car. And sure enough, there's a car. And, um, and I mean, you're so certain of it that, uh, that you have to say, no, this is a car. I can go back and describe it for you if you want, but I know there's a car there, and you're, you're correct. Uh, inexperienced viewers will also be that certain that there's a car there, but they're quite often wrong. An experienced remote viewer, when they say there's a car there, there's a car there. And um, I know one time I uh, heard the story about uh, Joe was given a target, a practice target, and um, just messed it up, something terrible. And so when uh, he got his feedback, he said to Skip, he said, I'm sorry, you gave me the wrong feedback. Skip checked, and sure enough, the wrong target was in the wrong envelope. He went and got the real target for that, those coordinates, and Joe had nailed the session. And I always thought, man, if I could ever be half that good. Right. And uh, not, long, not long afterwards, the same thing happened. The, the feedback was handed to me, and I was so certain because I had experienced that sight that I just handed it back and I said, you better check your envelopes because you got the wrong feedback. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, they had. And, um, uh, you know, I'll admit to being human, uh, beaming and proud and everything else, but, um, but the remote viewing can come to that point. Now, many times, though, you'll get a noun and you'll say, there's a car there. And the noun will be, there will not be a car there. However, it's called a symbolic noun, okay? And if you learn to recognize those, which a, an experienced remote viewer can, you realize that, um, that that symbolizes something. We have a, um, a tool called the Mini Phase 5, which works with symbolic nouns. 
And, you know, in this you say, okay, at its most basic level, what does car symbolize to me? Oh, well, it means going someplace. Oh, okay, getting somewhere. And what has happened is there is some project or something like that where the activity that's going on the site is actually going to take them to another place. And so you have seen a symbolic car. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, this last class I had, um, the uh, uh, target for one of the students was a Buddhist temple. And the viewer kept seeing, and it was an advanced class, the viewer kept uh, describing a bridge spanning from here to there. And we said, okay, where is here? And he would describe this city. It was a Buddhist temple in India. And uh, he would describe the city and we'd say, where is there? Oh, it's, uh, I, I can't tell, I can't see it. It's, you know, amorphous and, and all that. And what he was seeing was a physical symbol, a bridge spanning earth to wherever, you know, and he was describing Buddhism, but he had no word to say, you know, this. And so uh, many times a noun will come up like that, and it's very symbolic. In remote viewing, in controlled remote viewing, you find out that that kind of noun feels different when you say it. And when you learn through practice to recognize that feeling, then we say, okay, let's mini P5 that, and we'll break out the symbology behind it so we'll know what the target, how it applies to the target. And, um, and you know, we've been at this for 30 years now. And we've learned an awful lot through thousands and thousands of sessions, deeply analyzing what remote viewers do and how they do it and patterns they have and feelings they get when they get a noun and so on. And so um, we have learned to use these tools to break out this information. This is very much a science, very much. Perception. Uh, it's a rather tricky thing, actually. It's like the elephant story. Um, you can have one event or one place and ten people tell you a different story because they looked at everything from a, from a different angle here. And so it's, it's up to the, uh, to the trained person to sort out what it is that you want to work with. I'm going give to you, give you, for instance, um, Lynn gave me a target one time and um, this is a long, long, long time ago. And so I looked at it, and when I was done, now keep in mind, I'm not a remote viewer per se, even though I am a member of uh, the International Remote Viewing um, Association, IRVA. But uh, because I am not a trained, controlled viewer, Myself, I employ other, other things uh, in, in, in what I do. And so after a while, when I got all done with uh, what I thought he wanted me to do, I said to him, you know what? I said, this is Superman. And he said, no, it's not. It's Christopher Reeves. <laughs> so you see, I had the right, I had the right story. I just... I was so off, I was right, <laughs> you see, and that's how it, um, <laughs> it kind of works sometimes, and so the accuracy, depending how you look at it, you know, it could have even been really high or not at all, so it, it, it has to do with the eyes of the beholder, yeah, I think, um, and <laughs> so we have to see how it, how it plays out sometimes, and, um, <laughs> yeah, that was kind of reminiscent. <laughs> that was kind of kind of funny. And the other things, ever once in a while, somebody will. Yeah, I can't speak for the rest of them, but uh, sometimes someone will get, ask me to do something, and then I'll I will notice immediately 
that this is not an, this is not what I'm supposed to look at and so I call it a dud. A dud means uh, you know you don't belong here for instance if I wanna if I'm looking for a missing person and I end up with a squash um, uh, oh that was not a good word um, just do a car uh, I can tell whether I am on target with what I'm looking for or is something that doesn't belong there and so I'll say well no this is a dud uh, you know you deliberately put that in my pile of work here and uh, I remember one instance uh, it, it was a cat uh, I, it was a cat so I said well this is a cat however if this was a person and then I just continue like if it was a person so so some of us we can tell when people are trying to uh, play with our mind and uh, can't do that because uh, it doesn't quite work we um, see another clip Lynn Buchanan enjoy On some days you remote view well and on others you don't. Yes. Yeah. Uh, a little bit ago I was saying that remote viewing is a reflection of your life. Okay. On some days you work well and some days you don't. On some days you feel well and some days you don't. Mm -hmm. On some days you're organized. Other days, I mean, you can walk from here into that room and you have no idea why you just did it. Right. And, um, and humans are that way. And so the fact that some days you're good and some days you're bad mm -hmm. uh, is partly a human trait. Now there have been studies done, scientific studies, on a thing called uh, uh, local sidereal time. Uh, very few people know what it is. It's an astronomical thing. Um, let's say the sun is right here, the earth is right here, and you're facing the earth, and a star is out here let's say Vega, okay? Solar time, it's noon. Vega time, it's also noon. Six, uh, three months later, the Earth has moved around to here, mm -hmm. so solar time is not the same as Vega time, okay? Star time is different from solar time, and so there's a progression every day. What the research has found is <clears throat> that at 1300 four, hours 47 minutes every day the point where you are on the earth is facing the most it will toward the center of our galaxy mm -hmm. this is star time and it's 13 hours 40 minute, 1300 hours 40 minutes 7 minutes star time not the time you see on your watch okay mm -hmm. And that at eight, I'm sorry, at 1800 hours, you're facing toward the center of the galaxy. At 1347, you're facing the most you will face out of the galaxy toward empty space. And the times aren't 12 hours apart because the galaxy is like this, our solar system is like this, and our Earth is at a different angle and all that. All those angles, you know, come into play there. And so those two times, when you're facing the most out of the galaxy that you will, you all psychics, no matter controlled remote viewers, remote viewers, your natural psychic ability is going to be two to three hundred times uh, percent better than at any other time during the day. At 1800 hours when you're facing toward the center of the galaxy, don't even try. <laughs> uh, generally, uh, that's a psychic's nightmare. Uh, they're, they're, it's the psychic nighttime because it just seems to go away. And uh, there has been a lot of research on this, and it seems to actually work in practice. Um, and so this is something that natural psychics, as well as remote viewers, are learning to watch because, um, uh, because you know, it, uh, it does make a difference. Yeah. However, we're human. 
sometimes we're having a great day and at 1800 hours, hey, we're having such a great day you can have success. Sometimes you're having a bad day and even at the best times you're not going to do well. And so those two influences work together. And um, uh, so if a person says, oh, I have a sidereal watch and it's 1800 hours, so I can't do any good now. That's self-fulfilling prophecy. You convince yourself you can't do well. And so I tell people generally to ignore it, but to keep track of your session. When you get feedback, you've got the side of real time, and you can find out for yourself when you work best, when you don't work best, and so on. And there have been many theories about why local sidereal time affects psychic functioning. Um, many people have said, well, it must be the gravitational pull of the center of the galaxy. Okay. The gravitational pull of the center of the galaxy is less than that chair has on you. Okay. That can't affect it, okay? Uh, they say, well, it's radiation. They can't find any radiation. They say, well, it's background radiation or something like that. And everybody comes up with their own theory and nobody can prove anything. The fact is, it's like the word matrix. Everybody doesn't want to say, I don't know. So they come up with a theory. <laughs> and that way they get the grants and the study grants and all that. When the fact is, we have no idea. Okay. You know, we don't know what makes psychic functioning work. Computer mapping of the brain and entire body, entire body uh, has been tried, and it seems to show the functioning of, uh, of the brain when a person is remote viewing. However, turning that information around and saying, you can remote view better if you will just excite this part of your brain. Mm -hmm. Well, how do you do that, you know? I mean, you know, it, uh, the study has been there, and it's given us information, but it's not given us any help. Um, the hope is that as we understand things more in the future, we can learn more. But, um, but the fact is that right now, uh, at our stage in history, uh, we're just mucking along, doing the best we can, and, you know... Uh, we're getting there. We're learning the techniques. We're learning the physical things. And uh, the science is there, and it should be. The research is there. But at this point, the research hasn't helped any. You know, the physical research hasn't, hasn't helped any. It actually, we, it does, but the camera videotaping the viewer yes. doesn't help the viewer. If you have a monitor there, who then watches the films and says, okay, when was he most on target? What is his physical reactions? And the monitor learns to read the viewer, uh, which is what we teach, by the way, in, in the school. Um, then it has helped. But uh, we take many sessions, and what we find is that um, a, since this is physical in nature, the physical reactions of the viewer can be read. So we train the monitor. Uh, we train the monitor to read what's called micro movements. The monitor will uh, read all of your micro movements. When you get embarrassed, you blush. When you get sad, you, you tear up and things like that. And so those are natural micro movements that can be said about anybody. Uh, we even train the monitors to read micro movements down to the idea of when the pupils contract, mm -hmm. the viewer has seen something at the site that is bright or that is exciting even, the pupils will contract. When the pupils dilate all of a sudden, the monitor knows that the viewer has seen something sexual at the site. Mm -hmm. And we have learned through thousands and thousands of sessions to read a viewer's physical movements like this. 
then after the monitor learns to read all of those physical movements and micro movements and all, then we have a thing called controlled remote viewing micro movements. And that is the monitor have, knowing all of the real micro movements will know what's not a micro movement. And so the monitor will wait until the viewer, let's say, suddenly goes off target. And, uh, and let's say the viewer adjusts their paper right at that moment. The monitor will give some physical signal that the viewer's conscious mind doesn't see, but the subconscious mind sees it very clearly. Mm -hmm. And it thinks I saw that, okay? And then the monitor waits and waits and waits. And the viewer is working along maybe a month later gets off target and adjusts his paper, the two com combined. Mm -hmm. And the monitor goes, thanks, I saw that. Mm -hmm. About the third or fourth time that happens, the subconscious, which is very smart, realizes I can tell my monitor when old dummy up here goes off target, mm -hmm. quits listening to me. Mm -hmm. And from that point on, the monitor doesn't have to know what the target is he sits over there and watches, and sure enough, and the monitor makes a note to the analyst, middle of page six, viewer goes off target, From garbage starts. 90% of all language is nonverbal? Yeah, uh-huh. And, uh, and then you train in a micro-movement to tell the monitor when the viewer gets back on target. Now, the m viewer can never consciously learn what these movements are because you'll start faking them, you know. And so this is a third language in a remote viewing session that goes on between the viewer's subconscious mind and the monitor's conscious mind. And all the time that information about the target is going out onto the paper, information about the session is going on between the viewer's con subconscious and the monitor's conscious mind, so that the conscious mind of the monitor can take notes, tell the analyst where the good parts and are and where the garbage is and, and all that. And in doing that, we can take a viewer who has, let's say, 70% accuracy, and by selecting only the good parts, because we have watched the micro movements, by selecting only the good parts, we can take the information that is good and have maybe 90% accuracy. Mm -hmm. By the same token, we database everything. And we say, you know, this perception the viewer got, it's a color, okay? This other perception is a size or a shape or something like that. And we analyze these sessions, we split them up and put them into databases, and over a period of a hundred sessions, let's say. We can look at this database and it says, look here, this viewer is always accurate when it comes to color, but sizes and shapes, uh, go get another viewer, you know? Mm -hmm. And by then having a pool of viewers to work with, a customer comes in and wants to know the color of the getaway car, okay? And so we look through the database and we say, hey, this guy's always good on color. So we task him with the color. Now his overall average may be 70%. We look and the customer also wants to know the make and model of the car, okay? So we find out who's best at sizes and shapes and we task them with that question because they're good at that. And so we can take a whole pool of viewers who have 70% accuracy, and by databasing and tasking people toward their strengths, we can come back to the customer with 90 to 95% accuracy simply because we know exactly who's good at what. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and this way we, we can provide a better service to our customer, even though we don't have a single remote viewer maybe who can make 98% accuracy overall. We can come back with 98% accuracy on the information. Um, it's a science, it really is. Sure. 
in the year 2050? Yes. What will remote viewing be used for? Mostly. Been asked about the future of remote viewing many times, and so I have sat down. Well, I have hidden that question in envelopes that I've shifted, you know, and shuffled around so that I don't know when I'm getting the question. The And I've done this several times. The answer I keep coming up with is that remote viewing will be learned by more and more people. It will have more and more people developing it and honing it to where it gets better and better. And more and more, <clears throat> the truth will be available to everyone. Well, then you've got the mafia who learns that there are no secrets. You've got law enforcement who now learns that there are no secrets. That's dangerous to them too. You've got politicians who learn that there are no, no more secrets. Mm -hmm. You've got military people who learn that there are no more secrets. Okay, you know the kid that killed himself because of the hula hoop and the kid that killed himself over rock and roll and the kid that killed himself over dungeons and dragons and all. That same kid is gonna kill himself over remote viewing. You know, I don't think the kid ever existed in the first place. But, um, but all of a sudden, Preachers will start preaching against it. Teachers will start teaching against it. Someone who has taken a basic course 40 years ago in remote viewing commits a crime, and the headlines will read, remote viewer kills someone, you know, stuff like this. And uh, the witch hunts will begin. It will all go back underground. And when it does, you'll have a government sitting there waiting and it will pull from the best of that underground and it'll all go back and what has come around will go around and um, from what I keep seeing this whole thing about remote viewing in the public will be blown past and the government will wind up with remote viewers that are better than it could have ever had in any other way. That's what I keep seeing for the future of remote viewing. When uh, Courtney is uh, Courtney is an innocent bystander in that. Okay. Uh, nobody knows the real nobody knows the real right. story about that. Right. And remember that uh, they said that remote viewers verified it. Mm -hmm. Okay. For one thing, remote viewing doesn't verify anything. It just gives you the information. Mm -hmm. Okay. Second of all. Who were these remote viewers? Mm -hmm. They were, you know, Madame Zoltar. They were, you know, uh, uh, people who didn't even know what remote viewing is, who don't know that it's a science. But there are all these people who have popped up. I've had people call me and tell me that they were palm remote viewers and crystal ball remote viewers and aura remote viewers and all that. And I say, okay, well, how do you do it? Oh, well, I just sit back and I see it, you know. Remote viewing is a science. And um, when, when the information came out that the government used remote viewers for psychic spies, there were actually reporters driving around town looking for these palm signs on lawns so they could go into Madame Zoltar and say, what is remote viewing? Mm -hmm. Well, what's she gonna say? It's what I've done all my life. Mm -hmm. Right now, there are so many definitions for remote viewing that it has no meaning. And um, Ingo Swan. It's, it's been instantly diluted by all kinds of garbage. Um, Ingo had invented what was called coordinate remote viewing because he used coordinates. Well, uh, many people and you know several of the teachers who started just giving some random numbers at the beginning of a session and saying look i'm a coordinate remote viewer too i'm a coordinate crystal ball remote viewer too and uh, and not knowing at all what that meant or how to deal with it and they started claiming scientific you know and and touch you know touch with the the science and everything else Ingo finally came up with the word controlled. Mm -hmm. 
because these people don't want to be controlled. And uh, the fact is, controlled remote viewing means your remote viewing is controlled by the viewer. The viewer is not controlled. And, but uh, this ploy has worked. And so nobody's out there calling themselves controlled remote viewers. But the, um, the science of remote viewing mm -hmm. passed from a pure science to the military. And then when it got into the public, it was just, you know, destroyed. The terminology was destroyed. And so then the scientific method came back and said, okay, we're going to take this one term that nobody else, you know, will use. And uh, so everybody's out there listening to remote viewers and everybody's talking about remote viewing and all that. And uh, for the most part, they have no idea what they're talking about. Uh, it's a sad situation, but it's expected, you know. Um, serious hypnotist had this same thing happen when hypnosis came out. And uh, all of a sudden you had all these stage people making people clicking like chickens. And uh, medicine too. And medicine too, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, it's just a natural part. Mm -hmm. The uh, science itself is called controlled remote viewing, is a very, uh, very respectable, highly researched, documented science. Remote viewing, on the other hand, is uh, if I were walking through the desert and I found a lamp and I rubbed it and a genie came out, yeah. that would not make me Aladdin. No. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead, finish your analogy, but I just, yeah, I just wanted to point that out. Oh, I have no idea. If I knew, if I knew, <laughs> then I would do it better, wouldn't I? Would, would be... Yeah, but I would not ask where the information comes from because okay. I don't care. Okay. Um, people will come to me and they say, well, it comes from spirit guides. And I say, oh, thank you for the information. They come to me and they say, it comes from holograms in the universe. Mm -hmm. And I say, oh, thank you for that information. They come to me and they say, well, it comes from the super mind or the collective consciousness or whatever. And I say, thank you for that information. Listen, I don't care where it comes from. Mm -hmm. You bring that missing kid home and it can come from wherever you want. I don't care. I'm very practically oriented. I'm very applications oriented. And, uh, and if you want to believe it comes from your spirit guide or from God, or from angels, or wherever, and you can bring that kid home, hey, I'm happy. Mm -hmm. And, um, and you know, I, I really don't care where the information comes from. And if I ever found out where the information comes from, I would probably respond with, hmm, okay, now let's get to work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the way I am, sorry. Okay. <laughs> well, no, there is right or wrong. Okay. But the right or wrong doesn't come in the information about the target. The right or wrong comes in in taking the information from your body mm -hmm. and onto the paper. Your conscious mind says, uh, uh, oh, I felt, a, I felt a warm flush. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the target must be hot. No you write down, I felt a warm flush, you know? And, uh, and you, let's say you get a, uh, <clears throat> a perception that there's snow at the site, okay? Therefore, it must be wintertime. Mm -hmm. And you write down wintertime. Mm -hmm. No, there are ski runs all over that have snow in the middle of summer even in warm weather, because it's man-made snow and all this, that didn't mean it's wintertime. And this interpretation goes on almost continuously with especially inexperienced remote viewers. It could have been a cotton field also. Could have been a cotton field, yeah, and they just thought it looked like snow. <clears throat> and, or uh, on top of a mountain. 
whatever. Yeah. And uh, the thing is that um, you get the perception through, you're supposed to write it down. You're supposed to be the village idiot. Mm -hmm. But this continual interpretation goes through. And pretty soon you think <clears throat> uh, uh, there's snow, it's cold, therefore it must be winter. And so all of a sudden in your mind's eye, any person in the scene is wearing a heavy clothing. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know all of the stereotypical things of winter start getting imagined into your scene. This is what happens with natural psychics, which is you know where they uh, tend to mess up the most. And it happens with all remote viewers, no matter how experienced. But the more experienced you are, the more you learn to realize when it's happening and set it aside. And uh, it's a natural human tendency, and it's one that you have to deal with. Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to times when to do readings, and I hadn't really thought of this, is I'm at my peak at night, but then I was born nine hours ahead, and uh, I don't think my body ever adjusted. And so there's really some truth to being, being, yeah, not more in tune, but preferring to work different part, different times of the day. So um, the other thing is, what I find is when I am deadly ill, I am the most accurate, and I believe one of the reasons for that is is that I I'm just so out of my mind that my conscious mind doesn't have time to or the capability to interfere with what I'm doing. And so uh, when I'm really, really ill, <laughs> I get a lot of stuff done, so. Oh, I should have told you like two weeks ago, but I'm telling you now. The ending, um, this is 2010, and I'm not well enough to go to the studio to record the endings for, for the shows. Uh, I'm doing them at my home. And so what I did is I dug out the endings from the remote viewing conferences over the years, and I should have told you that earlier. So all the people you see walking around and the music is different than our regular format, that in the copyright year is different. Um, but these are some of the places, uh, actually Austin, Texas, I think it was, when we all went to the, the, a conference there. So let's see, next week we're going to continue with Lynn. And uh, I think I'll have a guest, um, a physical person, but I mean, as a guest, a physical person, and you don't have to always listen to me solo all the time. Enjoy your spring, summer, and uh, <laughs> for the East Coast, it springs right around the corner. And I'll see you next week with uh, show number four in the series on remote viewing. Thank you. Mr. K. Uh oh, we didn't get to say goodbye. I'll see you next week.
Okay. 